Good afternoon. Thank you very much for being here. I'm Elliot. I work on the FBI's Pittsburgh Cyber Squad. I work for Keith Malarski, and I'm joined today by two friends of mine, Tillman Werner, a senior security researcher at CrowdStrike, and Mike Sandy, a senior security researcher at Fox IT. What we want to do today is give you an inside glimpse into what probably the last two years of our life looked like leading up to this takedown, and talk to you a little bit about Game Over Zeus. Game Over Zeus being a banking Trojan, a piece of malware designed to steal money from business banking accounts. Uh, Game Over Zeus was incredibly sophisticated, incredibly successful, and at its heyday was able to defeat most of the security systems in place by major financial institutions. We did some pretty interesting, pretty pioneering work in this project. Mike's going to talk to you about the group we were up against, uh, very much an organized crime group, organized according to organized crime principles, very highly specialized in their trade. And Tillman is going to talk to you about the incredibly sophisticated measures we had to take in order to take control of this botnet, take it away from the guys running it, and maintain control. And I'd like to add that Game Over Zeus was designed in a lot of ways in response to previous industry and law enforcement investigations. It was designed to make it impossible for us to end up taking it over. So. I want you to pay very close attention because at the end we're going to announce a challenge which should lead to one of the bigger rewards ever offered to anybody at Black Hat. So before we get going, I would like to thank a number of individuals that were absolutely instrumental to bringing this on board. You know, if you ask me what I do for a living, I tell you I play team sports. And we had to build an incredibly big team to make this happen. Um, two of those members are here. I would like Brett and Frank to stand up. These handsome fellows right here did a ton of work. Thank you guys so much. Um, thank you very much. Uh, and then just a huge number of people in the private industry on the government side helped us out with this. A lot of really interesting work came out of um, some of our international partners. Uh, a lot of creative thinking came out of DOJ in order to ensure we could actually pull this off. So now Mike is going to talk to you about how this whole thing was put together organizationally and architecturally. Oh, but he, before he does that, I want to give you a quick example of what this looked like on the victim end, what the fraud cycle looked like, how they actually moved this kind of money successfully. The FBI's estimate was over 100 million lost in the United States, probably two or three times that internationally, just from Game Over Zeus or Peer to Peer Zeus. The guys responsible for this have been doing this a whole long time and made a lot more money than that. So generally what happened, the victim would get a spam email, that spam email would result in an infection. That infection would result in account takeover fraud, which would then result in an international wire using either correspondent banking, international banking, some ACH payments, but they actually displayed a remarkable understanding of US and other international banking systems, meaning they were able to move money, in most cases, a lot faster than we were able to chase it. Losses range from around $10,000, the single largest loss that we observed was $6.9 million. And I want to talk to you just for a second about that one specific loss to kind of give you an idea of what this looked like. So leading up to this, this would be November 6, 2012 was the time they stole the $6.9 million. Um, we were doing some really interesting work thanks to a good friend of mine over at Dell SecureWorks. Game Over Zeus the crew behind it started doing DDoS attacks against banks as soon as the fraud had occurred. And they did this for a couple reasons. One, now all the bank's internal security resources were tied up, observing, you know, trying to solve the DDoS attack. Why are we getting hit? What's affected? But they were also specifically attacking the e-banking login page for these financial institutions, preventing the victims from logging in and discovering the fraud. And that's a current theme with most malware designed to do account takeover fraud is they've got to increase that amount of time from when they execute the fraud to when the victim discovers it because that's when the whole chase for the money usually kicks off. Well, this Dell SecureWorks researcher figured out the specific dirt jumper, which is a DDoS botnet, command and control node that these guys were using and started sending me a live feed every time there was an attack. So now, instead of finding out about these frauds maybe days or even weeks later, we were notifying the bank sometimes within 10 or 15 minutes of the fraud occurring that they were being DDoS attacked because of a Game Over Zeus fraud and what specific characteristics to look for in terms of payees, where the money was going, how to chase it down. And so what happened is over a period of a couple months, we were able to go from, I mean, just an astronomical success rate on their part to where they were almost never successful. And I'm going to talk about that at the tail end of this talk. So this $6.9 million wire out the door on the 6th, we see the attack, we contact the bank, we give them the information. The bank has trouble finding this loss. 
the bank is in a unique position where most of their customers are other banks. So they really weren't prepared for this type of incident. They got DDoS attack for probably the next week, and that was really troubling for me to see because generally the length of the DDoS attack directly pertained to the amount of funds. And after three days, we were at the longest attack I'd seen. So when it went for six or seven, we were a little worried. And it was a little bit before that that they called me and said, we found it, it's big, it's in Switzerland. So we worked through where the money went, we worked with the Swiss police, we worked with a victim, and what we were able to do is get the person that had received those funds arrested. So in subsequent interviews with them, in partnership with the Zurich Canton police, we were able to figure out that this guy was mulling large sums of money for Game Over Zeus and other criminal organizations, um, and we were actually able to get those funds recovered and returned back to the victim. And that's one of the things that was really unique about this investigation, was getting beyond being behind the power curve and getting to the point that we were actually able to stop the frauds in relative real time and get them recovered and passed back to the victim. And now, Mike. All right, I'm, um, I'm going to talk about the, the operation, uh, both the structure of the group, but also some of the technical aspects be behind the malware itself. Um, basically, Zeus has existed for nearly a decade, and the first two versions that we distinguish, although the first two versions were basically the same, they're just like an evolution of the previous version, um, they were sold as kit malware. And kit malware means that you can actually purchase it and set it up on your own servers and only need, require basically um, support, support package to get the latest updates. Uh, but, but in 2010, the author of Zeus, uh, nicknamed Slavic, he basically announced that he wouldn't no longer support it and give the uh, support to other people. So actually what really happened, uh, he said that he would retire, but what actually happened is that he started a private branch and not anymore sell it as kit malware, but only as a, a kind of managed service variant of Zeus. And it was known as Murafat and Lycat. Actually, um, Zeus 2.1 was the version number used in that version and started in September 2010. That was the lead up to what we know as peer-to-peer -peer Zeus. Basically, um, peer-to-peer Zeus or Game Over Zeus, Game Over Zeus, the name comes from um, the command and control channel using gameover2.php when, when it started. So, Essentially, there was a group of people who were actually using the kit malware based, it goes at least back to 2009. Prior to that, we're not sure, or at least I'm not sure how, how far back it goes. Um, but that group was using the kit malware and then they merged into the private malware that was known as Zeus 2.1. And Zeus 2.1 had a number of uh, uh, features which were relatively unique to it. A domain generation algorithm to prevent takedown activity, uh, or to mitigate that. Um, regular expression support in the weapon jacks. Weapon jacks are the configuration format within Zeus. And a file factor called Lycat. And that's, a, it was, although a separate piece of malware, uh, but it was very integrated with, uh, with Zeus. So, uh, interesting technology that was new to that specific variant. Then, a year later, in September 11, 2011, basically they upgraded from this 2.1 variant to the peer-to-peer -peer Zeus, which internally is known map, as MAP and ver version number 13. They had a number of earlier versions which were just for development and testing. So initially that had a peer-to-peer -peer network, which was only designed to uh, let the uh, bad guys have continued to have access to the system, even though all the other command and control systems in the back end was disabled. Um, and it had traditional communication with uh, you know, TCP, HTTP, HTTP, PHP file. The group actually that used this was very focused on corporate banking accounts. Well, you see a lot of banking malware. Typically, consumer accounts are more attractive because there are many more. It's easier to infect random people who use online banking, but these guys really focused on the corporate banking accounts, although they also did consumer bank uh, fraud and other types of fraud like card not present. Individual operators also actually use it as a regular botnet, uh, as, as you know, something to monetize, as, as max, maximize their profits, basically. So they loaded other types of malware, like crypt fraud. And what probably many people will know is that CryptoLocker was also spread from this, and it was actually authored by the same person that wrote Peter Perseus. Obviously, it's quite special because CryptoLocker is something, you know, when it comes on your system, you're obviously, you know, going to notice the malware is there, and you won't be able to even, you know, you 
probably most people won't start to do their banking when they get their files encrypted. So. Um, talking about the group, um, the group basically has at least five years of experience. That's as a team. Um, it, it has changed slightly over time, but it, it has existed at the end um, basically as the diagram showed over there. Um, five years of experience, but the individual operators have actually, have actually uh, worked for more than 10 years uh, in many cases in the crime scene. And most of them are from Eastern Europe and Russia. Uh, Russia is the, the main, main group. Um, several people from Ukraine as well. Um, there are two leaders, and basically one of the leaders is Slavic, who is more uh, involved in the technical part in actually um, creating the malware, uh, setting up the backends, and managing everything from a technical perspective. And the other leader was more the organizational person um, in, uh, involved in um, the actual money movement and, and, and re new recruitment. So it's very typical, like a normal organization, although people were not just assigned one role. They had several roles, so it's not, you cannot say exactly the organization looks like this. Um, but it had a support team with dedicated support people, um, third-party suppliers who were supplying crimer kits like Black Hole, um, spam botnets like Cut Whale, and other services to just um, allow the affiliates, which are the actual users, to increase their botnets or uh, increase their revenue. Um, apart from that, obviously there was a mule network, and that was a large group of people. They were, they were coming, they were trying to recruit or trying to acquire as many mules as possible. So they had many different suppliers, and they had a very dedicated group of uh, people um, opening corp large corporate accounts, or basically corporate accounts, in places where you can easily establish uh, a business and a business account. Typically, like special economic zones or free economic zones. Um, in total, there were 27 different botnet IDs, and we get to that later. Um, and 27 IDs means that there were 27 different potential groups. We've seen so more or less 20 active uh, different affiliates, which could be one individual or an entire group of people. So this is a, a screenshot from their internal system. It shows a bit like how many different people uh, were just involved in just the muling part. Um, there is well over 50 people in total within this group, um, but you know there are some very specialists. But there are some things like, for example, mule recruitment, which are quite delicate and difficult um, ways to. They're difficult to get, uh, so there are a lot of people involved in that part. Looking at, for example, the technical part. Um, the hosting, so where did they get servers? Um, this has changed over time, but as, especially in the last period, the last few years, they had access to a bulletproof hosting provider who had a very good system uh, of having servers without an actual IP address, just a net block um, with a virtual IP, uh, and then had virtual IPs from a completely different ISP and routed that through tunnels to those servers. So in case anyone would take down the virtual IP addresses, it would just not route anymore, but the actual servers where the data was were safe because they were actually stored in a completely different location and only the, uh, the hoster of that would know where that data went and where the physical servers were located. And obviously those hosters weren't very cooperative, cooperative in um, exposing that. To protect all that, we had, they had uh, proxy servers, both from the command and control channel, which was incoming, but also for protecting the affiliates, the, the persons that actually committed the fraud, they also did not actually directly connect to the back end. So in case some information leaked, it would only leak a proxy IP and not the actual location of the back end. Looking technically at the peer-to-peer -peer network, um, to manage that, they didn't have a separate tool. Basically, the builder, and those of you familiar with Zeus and the kit malware, uh, there was a Zeus builder, uh, which was a graphical user interface. Um, to create the, um, the malware, like a build of the malware, and to compile the configuration into a binary format. Um, Game of Zeus had something along those lines. Um, it was actually based on the old version, but it was actually a command line version, but they still called it zsb.exe. So Zeus Builder, the original builder was also called zsb.exe. Um, 
it was used to control the peer-to-peer -peer network through a private RSA key. We presume that there was only one or maybe several people that had access to that. Later, in later versions, they actually used this builder also to debug the peer-to-peer -peer network by crawling a network. Um, that was something probably done in uh, response to attempts to poison the network. To uh, going off more on that, um, to counter these attacks, actually they had special debug, debug builds of the malware, uh, which had log files of everything that happened on the network layer, and they would use, for example, Wireshark and these debug builds to figure out what uh, people that were poisoning the peer-to-peer -peer network were actually attempting to do. This is an example of a, of a packet that would go over line. It was completely encrypted with their own uh, encryption algorithm. Um, however, if you decrypted the peer-to-peer -peer packet, actually you would end up with an HTTP packet which had um, uh, a generic HTTP layout. And important here is that there is an XID header which actually specifies which botnet within the peer-to-peer -peer network and the backends this uh, bot and this communication actually belongs to. So there was a proxy which was also acting as a router which routed the packets to the right backend and then facilitated um, to that communication. This wasn't only in the regular communication, this was also in the configurations of the bot. So um, it goes a bit far to explain the whole concept of web injects, but the target pattern, uh, for example, is something that you need to know. It's the, the target, in this case, is Macy's.com. Um, but then it also has bot ID statements. So in this case, there's only one, 7777. It's, it shows that this web inject, this specific statement, is only applies to one botnet. And that was needed because the configuration was actually spread through the whole peer-to-peer -peer network. So using the builder, you would upload the, con the, the Slavic would, for example, upload the configuration, but it would be the same configuration of every system. But then the bot, which had a bot ID built in, or botnet ID building had to figure out which configuration parts were applying to that specific botnet. In the bot were actually a large number of commands. So these facilitated mostly the fraud purposes. For example, um, the, the, the cookie stealing, uh, which were both the regular browser cookies, flash cookies, but also certificates. And they could retrieve those but also could delete those. For example, if you had a session open with a website, um, if you had a session cookie, you would not ha have to log in. So they removed the cookies so to force the victim to log into the website, and then the post data login would actually catch, capture that data, the login data, the username password. Uh, additionally, the blocking of URLs, um, that is to facilitate, for example, uh, similar to the DDoS part, to if the victim was, you know, if, if the victim was a victim of fraud, they would actually block the banking URL so that the victim couldn't access the bank anymore. Interesting in these is the, the highlighted ones in red. Uh, those are commands to search for uh, files on the system. And it came to us that in 2012, 2013, they have been working on um, searching for specific information. Um, this information wasn't typical for a financial malware botnet. It was actually geopolitical in nature, and we have some examples, we'll go over those later. But it shows that there was something different going on which was unusual compared to everything else what we see in the, in the financial malware space. Like typical espionage, just corporate espionage, or something for trading, stock trading, information from companies to have advanced knowledge of certain events which could you know, influence the stock price. Uh, but this was something completely different. It had nothing to do with typical financial malware. Um, actually, this hasn't been published before, and we have a white paper out that should be out right now that actually details a lot of the information in the search keywords, and then you can read those and translate them and base your own opinion on that. I want to highlight several. Um, so there, were, well, there was one botnet which was actually hidden from... Uh, all the other operators within peer-to-peer -peer Zeus, or at least most operators, um, actually that botnet ID did not exist in many of the systems, but it was, it was there and it did have a backend that was active, and it was targeting specifically Georgia and Turkey, and searching for things like, you know, intelligence a agency names within those countries, um, information that that country or the governments within that country would have on Russian 
specific Russian things. Um, very interesting was the, 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 the keywords that were in, in Turkey, which also involved the, the Syrian conflict, which borders with Turkey, and recently was in the news with a lot of, uh, with actually Turkey becoming involved in the Syrian conflict. Um, you can see there are some interesting keywords like Russia, mercenary, Syria. So obviously, you know, someone wants to know what kind of information uh, the Turkish government has on, or knowledge has about Russian mercenaries fighting in Syria. Then the botnet that was targeting Ukraine actually was a separate botnet, but that botnet was first used for financial fraud, and then later actually they repurposed that botnet to go um, to do the espionage. And actually that happened, you know, when the start of the U Ukraine Russian recent Ukraine Russian uh, Russian conflict. Basically, they were searching for only like a limited number of keywords, which were the names of secret documents or classified documents and the agencies, the, the intelligence agencies within Russia, uh, Ukraine. So it was just an initial set of keywords, while the other two botnets, or the other botnet with Georgia and Turkey had a, a number of keywords were very specific. So they had names of um, people working at the intelligence agencies also as keywords. So um, I want to introduce Tillman. He's going to talk about specifically the um, the attack that was done on the peer-to-peer -peer network and how that actually worked. Okay, thank you, Mike. Uh, hope that you guys can hear me okay. So um, before I go into the details here, um, I just want to uh, take a step back and um, um, explain why it was necessary to attack this botnet on a technical level. So it should be pretty clear by now from Mike's analysis that this was a significant threat, um, very well organized, and um, I mean this entire infrastructure was built to be undestructible, undestructible more or less. So you can ask a question, why would somebody be so crazy and you know, try, to, uh, try to take this over or take this down? Well, um, the answer to that question is um, Elliot will uh, later talk about the legal uh, part of this operation. Um, it's very risky in a way if you only if you don't combine a legal operation with a technical operation because what we have seen in the past is that when the bad guys when they realize that they've been investigated they try to destroy evidence and all these um, Zeus variants including this one here um, they have a command it was on the slide that, that Mike showed earlier um, they have a they have two commands one is called OS kill and the other one is called user destroy they are very destructive commands and they can be used to basically um, brick a machine, destroy a machine, an infected machine. So we anticipated um, or assumed that if um, this legal operation um, is started and they, they realize that, that they would probably try to destroy some machines. So um, then we said um, we need to make sure that that can't happen. We need to make sure that we control the, the command channel of the botnet and that you know, the bot, botnet operators are not able to issue any commands anymore. So, I mean, that's easier said than done, especially for like these uh, dynamic peer-to-peer um, -peer botnets um, like this one here. Um, but I'm going to explain how we achieved that. And um, um, for you to understand how we did that, it's necessary that we talk a little bit about the in botnet infrastructure first. So, um, Game Over Zeus actually follows a very popular um, concept or idea. It, we have seen that in other botnets as well, not very many, but the, the creme de la creme, so to speak, the, the more sophisticated botnets, they all use this kind of topology. Um, the bottom layer that you see on the slide here, that is the peer-to-peer -peer network. So every infected machine stores a list of neighbor nodes that it talks to, not all the other infected machines, just a subset. And this is self-organizing. They're updated all the time, peers talk to each other, much like in the, those peer-to-peer -peer file sharing networks, okay? and um, the uh, Slavic and his gang, they could use this peer-to-peer -peer network to propagate binary updates, configuration updates, and they did that all the time. Um, but it's more convenient to operate a botnet when you have a centralized command and control infrastructure. You want to have a centralized panel that you can log into and, um, you know, b b command the bots. So what, what most of these botnets do is they have a centralized layer on top, usually hidden behind proxies, so the, the red uh, dots that you see here on this slide, those are proxies. 
um, we call them uh, principal servers, and behind that you have the actual backend system, which is usually more than just one computer. Um, so um, you can see these uh, these white nodes in the peer-to-peer -peer network. Those are special nodes, and we will talk a little bit more about that in a, in a second. Um, any peer that is publicly reachable, I mean, you can imagine these days most infected machines are behind some sort of firewall or NAT, so you cannot directly talk to them. But some of them are publicly reachable, and they actually have a, a more prominent role in the network. We call them proxy nodes because they um, take peer-to-peer -peer messages and translate them into the HTTP protocol that Mike was showing, and that is then sent upstream to the, to the command and control backend. So that is the infrastructure, and um, in order to attack this, we had to understand the inner workings of the protocol, of the peer-to-peer -peer protocol, the custom protocol that these guys created. Um, we're not going to go into too much detail here. Um, just to give you an overview, these are the protocol primitives. Um, you could request another peer's version. It would reply with this, its version number. Um, the purpose of this is if another machine is running a more up-to-date uh, configuration version, for example, you could request from, from it, and then that's how information propagates in the peer-to-peer -peer network. And then the two highlighted in red here, um, those are peer list requests and peer list replies. Those are the messages that are responsible for dynamic updates of neighbor lists, of peer node lists at, at the infected machines. And um, yeah, I think I'm going to skip the other ones, maybe um, um, 6 and 50, those message types, they're for announcements of these white nodes, the proxy, proxy nodes, as we call them. OK, um, so this is what a peer list request looks like on the wire. We already decrypted that for you. So you're looking at the raw bytes. Um, of course, it's a binary protocol, so you won't see any text in here. But um, the information that's highlighted in blue, that's what you see um, uh, at the top of the slide. So there is um, the type. The type number two is a peerless request. They have some random padding just to uh, thwart um, signature-based detection, um, network-based detection. Um, two things that are interesting uh, are the, the other two fields here. Every infected machine has a unique pseudo-random ID. It's this hash that you can see here, the bot ID. Um, that actually comes in handy when you uh, try to estimate the size of the bot that if you have access to this information, you can just collect these bot IDs and then uh, count the number of infected machines. And there's also a session ID. And uh, the purpose of that, um, I think uh, that makes sense when you look at the next slide. So the next slide is um, the respective peer list response. And that has to have the same session ID as the request. By this, they make sure, and this is just one of many examples um, how they hardened their custom protocol, they make sure that you cannot send unsolicited peer list responses to an infected machine. Um, otherwise, if they wouldn't have that, that machine would just take the response and maybe you know, add these peers to its local list, uh, and that would be um, an angle for a poisoning attack, what we call a poisoning attack. They want to avoid that. They want to make sure that um, any response has to match a request. And that's what they use the session ID for. And well, in this case here, we're not showing the binary data. We already parsed that. So you can see the peer list contains, um, consists of entries that have a, the bot ID, a bot ID, an IP address, and a port. Um, the ports are UDP ports. Um, the protocol is UDP based, which um, is standard and fairly, fairly common with PDP protocols. So knowing how on a high level how this whole peer-to-peer -peer protocol works. How can you use that in, a, in an attack? Because the challenge, obviously, is the uh, distributed infrastructure here. In a centralized botnet, you would just take out the central command and control server. That doesn't really exist here. Or if you would take it out, um, the bad guys can easily reintroduce one using their peer-to-peer -peer technology. So in this case, we actually we have to attack the peer-to-peer -peer layer. So how do you do that with the information that we just talked about? Well, the goal is we want to isolate all the infected machines, destroy all the links between those machines so they cannot talk to each other anymore, and instead introduce our own nodes as the only peers that those machines can, can talk to or know about. So essentially, we want to, and this is just a, uh, an example picture here. So when you look at this as a graph, um, you basically want to remove all these edges between the nodes and introduce new ones, and also introduce the, the white machine here, so that's a machine that we control, and basically turn 
the distributed peer-to-peer -peer network back into a centralized one that can then more easily be controlled. Okay, so we would call this white thing here, we would call that a sinkhole. And in reality, you have, usually have more than just one. So when you do this, um, what does an infected machine see? So on this slide, you see um, the local peer list of an infected machine. These are a peer's neighbors that it knows about, that it can talk to. And essentially what we want to do is we want to turn this into something like this. So this is a poisoned peer list. All legitimate entries are removed and we introduce two that are pointing to, to two sinkholes. Obviously these IP addresses are not real. Um, they're example IP addresses. But this is essentially what we want to achieve. And we can do that by exploiting certain weaknesses in the peer-to-peer -peer protocol and um, you know, manipulating all the peer lists. So let's take a step back again. So if you are able to do this, if you're able to attack the peer-to-peer -peer network, if you're able to sinkle it, introduce your own peer, the sinkhole peer, and destroy all the other links, what does that mean for the botnet? Is the bot master still, still able to push commands to the bot? The answer is, unfortunately, yes, because um, the command channel, the actual command channel is on top of the peer-to-peer -peer network. It's an overlay network. It's an additional network on top of this. Um, so let's assume we um, manipulated the bottom layer here. We control that. This um, green dashed line, that is um, how a peer talks to the, to the back end. It would uh, reach out to one of its proxy nodes, the white ones, and that would then translate the message into an HTTP request and send it up upstream. So even if you sinkhole the P2P layer, this would still be possible. And um, that's, of course, bad, because if, if that is possible, the bot master can just you know, push an update, somehow try to mitigate our attack, and um, the effort would be pointless. So we have to make sure that we control this, this channel here as well. And, um, well, it's essentially a very similar attack um, because this is another peer-to-peer -peer layer on top of the, uh, the other peer-to-peer the -peer layer. So it's a very similar attack. Um, before I um, explain how we, how we did that, how we attacked that layer, um, I have to talk a little bit more about these proxy nodes, the white ones. Um, what you see at the bottom of the slide here is a red machine that was, um, I think that was hosted in the Netherlands, and that machine was part of an automated process. This machine would constantly monitor the health status of the botnet. Um, in other terms, the number of wh the white nodes, the proxy nodes, because the worst thing that can happen is that there are no white proxy nodes in the P2P network anymore, because that would mean that the machines couldn't be tasked or commanded anymore, right? So if that number would drop below a certain, certain threshold, the red machine would automatically promote other infected machines to new proxies, to new white nodes. And it would do that by providing it with a signed message, an announcement, the red one, and the white machine would then take this message and propagate it in the P2P network to announce itself. So, yeah, and, and then also every infected machine, regardless of whether they're the white ones or green ones, so any infected machine um, maintains a list of up to 20 proxies um, just to have backup, um, and one of those would be the active proxy. So if that active proxy for some reason would become unreachable, um, the infected machine would switch over to one of the other ones. So our goal, of course, was to poison this list, the proxy list, if you will, poison that as well, um, kill all the legitimate entries and introduce our um, um, pointers to machines that we control. And you can do that by making sure that none of the proxies responds anymore, um, and then you introduce your own one, um, and that would then cause a switch to, to your proxy. Um, that did require some collaboration with, with ISPs um, because they had to, um, we were not able to promote ourselves to proxies, so they, they had to uh, provide us with machines that used to be proxies in the past or at that time. So these guys were really smart. I mean, they designed a pretty sophisticated botnet. So they said, okay, even if, uh, you know, despite 
of all these countermeasures, it, it's, it might still be possible that somebody manages to poison the network. So what do we do if that happens? And they introduce the backup channel, and it's, that is this the DGA channel. So DGA stands for Domain Generation Algorithm. I think Mike mentioned it on one of his slides briefly. Um, so what Game of Zeus does is every um, week it generates 1,000 domains, pseudo-randomly, and um, if um, connectivity with the peer-to-peer -peer network would uh, drop, it would then um, consult the DGA, uh, resolve the domains, go to that IP address that it would get back, and download a new seed peer list with fresh peers, a fresh set of peers. Um, they use six different top-level domains, six different TLDs um, for their domains. They use, use com, dot, uh, com, org, net, biz, and info. They're all um, based in the US and um, with some collaboration with the stakeholders here, it was possible to make sure that nobody could register these domains anymore um, while we were doing the operation, the takeover, um, but also .ru. And um, I mean, Mike was showing the picture. Um, we opted for the safe way and um, registered all these by hand, the domains for a certain time window, which were like, I don't know, several hundred, to make sure that those are not available to the bot master anymore. Okay, so how do you combine these things in an attack? So um, leaving the DGA backup channel aside, that was taken care of. Um, this is what the, bot, the healthy botnet looks like. Um, the first thing we wanted to do is, was uh, we, we wanted to control the command and control channel first, the, one that, the channel that was used to push commands. That was the most important thing. So the first thing we did was we uh, took control of some of the proxy nodes here. Um, so the blue ones, those were controlled by us. And then we burned the centralized infrastructure here. We killed those, uh, those uh, um, principal servers here. One was located in Canada and the other one was in the Ukraine. They were taken down at the same time in a coordinated effort. Um, and that meant that none of the peers could talk to their active proxies anymore. They wouldn't be able to reach the backend anymore. And then um, they would search for a new proxy and eventually end up at one of the blue nodes that we control. So that channel was already blocked. Now, it's still possible to um, hook a peer into the network and propagate a, a binary update or a configuration update and, and propagate that in the P2P network. So we had to sync all that as well, that layer, and that's what we did. So we introduced our own peer and then over time slowly degenerated the botnet into this. And at this point, um, we had full control over it and we still do today. All right, so. Thank you. So these are some stats we stole from Shadow Server, who gratefully supported the entire operation. Um, the uh, image on the top, that just shows an infection map. Um, you can see that basically any developed country had infections. Um, what's more important is the graph at the bottom. Um, when, on the day where we um, did the takeover, we started out with, I think, something like 350,000 unique IP addresses. I have to explain, this group here tried to keep the number of infections around 200,000. And it's also important to realize that unique, unique IP addresses in, a, let's say, a 24-hour time period doesn't mean there are so many infected machines. You have to um, take a look at the bot IDs. But um, what you can see here is that there are still, if you compare the numbers from yesterday, that's the, the right hand end of the graph, to uh, the numbers from when we did the operation, there are still 10% infected machines left. I mean, it's good that there, that 90% have been remediated, cleaned up, I don't know, the systems have been reinstalled or whatever. And um, we also have to thank AV. Um, they they uh, did a tremendous job. They pr provided removal tools. And probably some of these machines have been cleaned up using these tools. But there's there still 10% left, which means we have to uh, keep this up as long as necessary. And with that, um, before I hand it back over to Elliot, and he will talk about the legal the, uh, um, part of the investigation, um, the question is, um, yeah, I think I, I'm just going to hand it back over to you. All right. So I want to talk to you for just a little bit about what some of the evidence looked like that we collected on this group. Uh, one of the first things we noticed is they were running a version of Black Hole 
Um, that black hole version they were running pointed back to something called an iframe checker or IFR check. Uh, and we were able to get access through some of our partnerships with industry to some back end pages revealing useful nicknames for us like Chingus, Dead, Petro, X Man, um, which at least gave us an idea who, you know, who are we looking at? Who are the people on the forums that are doing this? Where are they at? They brought everything in house. So what was very unique, as Mike mentioned about this group, is they looked at it from the outset like it would an organized crime operation. They owned every part, they put everything under one roof. Very, very good for them from a logistical standpoint, very good for us from a law enforcement standpoint. I wanted to share uh, just a little bit here. You see, starting from this moment, all drop managers with whom we were working are now working through this panel, right? This panel being the business club, which is one of their principal servers they were running. So what did the business club look like? Well, we had logins, special temp, which was a login we were able to tie back to Bogachev. Um, we started doing searches of email addresses, discovering references to business club. We started seeing them exchanging emails with business club accounts. And one of the really great things they did was keep a very accurate list of all their fraud. So this was called a ledger system. This is a bit of an eye chart. Um, and this was on another server hosted on the business club. They called this Visit Coast Weekend. And this ledger system kept track of every fraud, what the bank account was, who the victim was, who was responsible for arranging the drops, who was cashing it out. And it was reassuring to us to find the victims that we knew of appeared on this chart. So this was really good evidence and gave us great insight into how quickly they operated and how much money they were making. So how do we figure out who these guys are? Well, fortunately, fortunately, they're criminals all the time. So one of the things we try to do as law enforcement is, is work ourselves where we can kind of attack those seams between their personal life and their criminal life. And fortunately, Mr. Bogachev, fond user of VPNs, liked to use the same VPN to log into some of his personal accounts as he would to administrate the back end of some of these servers. Now, just criminal means alone weren't able to attain the results we wanted. In fact, to do the takeover that Tillman described previously, required really, really complex use of the civil statutes here in the U.S. And we had a great team from DOJ assisting in this. But, you know, we weren't able to just say this is a crime, we need to finish it. We actually had to take this into a civil courtroom, get in front of the judge, and basically explain what was going on, order him to cease activity, get approval to start up the servers that we wanted to, um, and then do some other process to make sure we could receive the communications and control everything that was passing back and forth. The idea being we didn't want the victim's traffic to make its way out on the internet. We didn't want to see these people continue to be victimized. And we certainly didn't want to leave open the possibility that either the actors could choose to destroy the user's computers or push crypto locker on them, encrypting their, you know, their computers, effectively doing the same thing. This is our friend. So fond of cats, as I know many of us are. Um, it's a nice young lady he's with. And he also loves aquatic life. So this is his boat. And this is where you win money. So our prize today is, uh, I think, the highest reward we've ever offered for a cyber criminal, $3 million, information leading to his arrest. And we chose to go this route instead of waiting, instead of letting him continue to victimize people for a couple years, hoping you'd go somewhere we could get at him. We thought we'd put the case out there, we'd put the evidence out there, we'd publicize this, we'd tell you who he was, and we'd hope that some of his friends back home bring him to visit us so that we can make them very, very wealthy. Why does this matter? So a quick story. I told you earlier about some of the work we did to proactively try to get ahead of the frauds, to recover the funds, to work, to get past where we were merely reacting to these frauds, where we could better protect U.S. and international victims from these large-scale account takeover frauds. Because, you know, a loss of $10,000 may not be that much money. A loss of, you know, a million, two million, five million, six point nine million $6.9 million is the kind of thing that can bankrupt a company. And we, we absolutely don't want to see that happen. Starting about October, November of 2012, 2013, excuse me, leading into our takeover, which happened June 2014, up until Dyer and Drydex started coming online, and especially Dyer. So now we're in, we saw fraud starting September, October 2015. Or excuse me, we had one year in the U.S. where we basically didn't see any large account takeover fraud. So, you know, I think what we've showed to this is we absolutely can disrupt these operations. These are important, but it can only be done in concert with private industry, law enforcement, international partners all working together at one time. So what we want to do now is take some questions from you guys. We've got a central 
uh, microphone right there. We've got about five minutes left, so we'd love to hear from you all what you want to know. In the chart that shows the, uh, the number of infections, there are these intermittent dips all the way down through the chart. What were those representative of? So this is a very common diurnal pattern that you see. I mean, computers are turned off overnight, and then you have weekends and so on. So this is a very, very common pattern that you see when you track whatever network, any, any botnet. If you ask a question, we actually have some uh, patches for you from our uh, armored vests we wear. So if you ask one, just run up here and we'll give you one. Good question. Next. Do these guys have any connection to the DD4BC or some of the other financial extortion groups that are happening right now? No, I, I wouldn't say they do. Um, how was your experience with the uh, Russian law enforcement agencies, because according to Krebs, they're uh, internet, basically. They're on payroll. We talk to them. We continue to talk to them. We'd love to see some cooperation. Um, you know, that, that's probably as much as I can say. Sorry. <laughs> so uh, what are some of the legal concerns of other researchers trying to do the same things involving malware command and control servers to be, I guess, mindful of? So go find your local field officer, law enforcement agency, tell them what you want to do, partner up. I mean, every country's got different laws. When you start doing things in different places, it gets incredibly tricky. I think this is a really important area to grow in, but you just have to be very careful. Um, you know, and I think one of the best ways is jump on one of the task forces, one of your local LE agencies, and, and find out what they're working on and go after it. Does that make sense? Yep. Please, go so, ahead. Um, yeah, maybe to add to that. Um, I mean, in my experience, um, people who are researching the same topics, they tend to gravitate, gravitate towards each other. We knew who else was working on this. I mean, it's perfectly possible that somebody else was doing their research in their basement, but I think we had a pretty good idea of who else was uh, tracking and researching this, and we coordinated with these people. While you were working on this, how much other stuff was happening that was successful and being not successfully pursued by your organization or others. I mean, this is a big, successful, visible activity, but I also wonder how much was still going on even while you were doing this. I think it's hard to say. There are um, hundreds of operators in this space, and a lot of are small, but this was one group that was, um, because of the targeting of corporate accounts, um, they had a huge financial impact over the years. Um, I think it wasn't specifically mentioned, but uh, within the U.S., the estimates are around 100 million. But they targeted Asia, uh, Europe, and um, well, basically like everywhere. There were attacks, and they would would actually run their operation 24 hours. So it was, you know, it started in the morning in, in Australia, and it went on to the you know the, the late afternoon in the U.S. So it was always busy. Um, and obviously, you know, they made a lot of impact, um, but it's impossible to just even quantify it, or start to quantify how much activity there is, but it's definitely just, it's just only one group, there are more, so. Uh, quick question, with Slavic now being uh, heavily wanted, do you think that you'll start seeing him running an operation this size again, or do you think he's going to go try and do something else? Yeah, so that was the question, right? I mean, would we do this and he'd pop right back up? What, one of the reasons we burned his nicknames and his presence and everything else was to try to make it that much harder. The, the criminal ecosystem is really interesting, and he's a liability now to any group he goes and works with. So we were worried about that. I'm sure he's probably not leading a great life right now, but we haven't, he's not on my radar popping up doing anything yet. Well, um, I, I want to thank you for that question because it's an important one, and I want to stress again how important it is to combine a technical with a legal operation. I mean, we've been taken over botnets in the past without involving law enforcement, and what we, what we learned from these cases is that they can recreate botnets that we took over within 20 minutes, so without involving law enforcement, it's more or less pointless. We know that these days. 
Hi. From a, a law enforcement perspective, you're dealing with hundreds of thousands of U.S. computers. Was there any particular method or was it a trial and error kind of way of, of figuring out how to deal with PII and, and PII indicators and things like that? Yeah, so I'd love to spend a lot of time. Basically, we chose to get a pen register to drop any PII. We didn't retain it, so we didn't have to get the approval to do a wiretap in order to have all that information. So we had to carefully tailor how we ran the sinkhole to make sure we weren't dealing with that. If that does that kind of answer your question? It, it, it does, yes. Yeah, great. We've got to stop now. Um, I'm going to go. We have a booth. The Bureau's got a booth. We'd love to sign you all up. Um, I'm going to go over there if you guys have more questions. And if you ask us a question, please come up. We've got a patch for you. Thank you very much.